and welcome back from lunch. Uh, we're going to start our third session, um, and it's going to be about nutrients. Uh, my name is Eric Dunlady. I work for the San Jose, Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility, City of San Jose. Um, so our third session is going to be about nutrients, or at least um, it will be about uh, certain water quality effects uh, that are oftentimes linked to or associated with nutrients. Um, some of you who may not be plugged into the nutrient science effort um, or um, may be relatively new here or not in the wastewater community may wonder why nutrients. Um, San Francisco Bay receives some of the highest nutrient loads among estuaries worldwide. Uh, with much of the loading coming from uh, wastewater discharge to the bay. Um, and despite these high loadings, the bay has not historically experienced the water quality problems typical of other nutrient enriched estuaries, like persistent, very high, unhealthy levels of algal biomass and low dissolved oxygen. It's not known whether the current level of nitrogen loading uh, or nutrient loading will continue to, or uh, which will continue to increase in proportion to uh, human population increase is sustainable over the long term. So special studies and expanded monitoring funded by the RMP and also funded um, in large part by uh, separate contributions by uh, wastewater agencies um, are carried out through the nutrient management strategy um, to examine water quality conditions that can serve as ecological indicators um, and responses. Um, to uh, uh, ecological indicators of nutrient over enrichment. In addition to examining those ecological indicators and responses, the potential impacts and causal factors um, of these potential negative conditions on human ecological health, human and ecological health need to be more extensively evaluated. And unlike most of the pollutants of concern that we're familiar with in the RMP, and this goes back to uh, sort of what Bill was talking about um, this morning, um, in the RMP and the regulatory world, we're usually thinking about things in terms of their toxicity. And nutrients uh, don't fit that typical dose makes the response framework. Um, nutrients are rather an essential component to a healthy estuarine system because without them, algae, oh, which are the primary producers in the base of the food web, can't grow to support higher trophic levels. Uh, so some nitrogen is absolutely essential for a healthy bay. Um, but too much uh, nutrients can, uh, can cause problems. And the nutrient issue is further complicated because of the bay's response to nutrients. Uh, it's influenced by a number of physical and biological factors, including suspended sediment concentrations, light, in, light availability, freshwater inputs, ocean conditions, and, and other factors. So these factors themselves vary throughout the bay, and a wide range of monitoring and special studies are needed to understand what might happen to bay water quality as a result of changes in nutrients and other factors. Uh, so the three talks today are related to some component of evaluating those ecological uh, responses to nutrients. And our first speaker is Dr. Barbara Baginska. Uh, Barbara's been with the Planning and TMDL Division of the San Francisco Bay Water Board for the past 12 years. Um, she holds a PhD in Earth Sciences from Warsaw University in Poland and a master's degree in hydrogeology and groundwater management from Sydney University of Technology. Uh, before uh, coming to the water board, she worked for seven years for the Environmental Protection Authority in Sydney, um, Australia. And Barbara is going to be presenting on one of the factors that are used to evaluate nutrient over enrichment, although it's, that's not the only thing that affects um, dissolved oxygen. She'll be telling you about uh, dissolved oxygen TMDL for Sassoon Marsh. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here to my talk after um, a delicious lunch. Um, as you can see from somewhat extended title of my presentation uh, compared to what's on the agenda, um, the focus of my talk today will be on um, developing and interpreting water quality objectives for dissolved oxygen in Sassoon Marsh, which um, we have attempted at the San Francisco Bay region for the first time since the 1970s. 
And some of you may have heard already me talking about this project. It's been my life for the past five years. Um, so um, I still hope that there will be a couple of new things that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, alternatively, uh, you can have a little siesta after that delicious lunch. <laughs> Done this again. Uh, uh. Okay, so um, that's the second, uh, that's the third slide. <laughs> okay, so um, during today's presentation, I will try to. <laughs> Thing. Oh. <coughs> okay, so could I use the keyboard or okay. Or, okay, so um, during the presentation today, I'm going to try to explain a little bit what causes low DO in uh, Cisun Marsh Sloot and what prompted us to developing the objective, although accidentally it doesn't seem to be linked to nutrients. And I will talk about the, um, the approach that we use to develop the objective, uh, a, little bit, a little bit about the spatial and temporal applicability, how we validated the thresholds using the available data, and of course I will mention the TMDL and also um, some opportunities to apply these objectives elsewhere, elsewhere in the bay, like in the, for example, lower South Bay to other sloughs and marshes. Um, so let's start with the causes of low DO. Um, so in this double plot, you see uh, an example of DO concentrations measured in uh, Goodyear slough in western portion of the marsh and under ambient conditions on the left and after um, the slough receives multiple discharges from the managed wetlands on the right. Um, the red dots, of course, represent the, uh, the DO measurement at 15 minutes and the, uh, the gray line in the background is the water level uh, fluctuation due, uh, due to tidal action. So under ambient conditions, DO basically fluctuates on daily basis from about 3.5 to 8 milligrams per liter, and um, it changes with uh, tidal action, temperature, salinity, and other factors, and sometimes it becomes even much lower than 3.5 when it's a, a natural um, uh, high um, uh, seasonal productivity. Uh, which causes, of course, the high organic um, load. Uh, on top of these natural fluctuations, each fall we see a significant decrease in DO concentrations, as, as seen on the right, um, which results from these um, multiple discharges <coughs> from the uh, managed wetlands that discharge to the surrounding sloughs. And, um, Basically, this happens because of the water management that is conducted in, this, uh, in these um, managed uh, wetlands or ducklands. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a perspective what is happening there, um, almost half of the marsh has been converted to managed wetlands, which are um, dikes and separated from tidal action by levees. And part of the water management is uh, that um, there is a controlled flooding and circulation of water each fall um, that is done uh, to uh, improve um, habitat conditions, feeding and resting grounds for duck clubs, but it also helps um, other birds on the Pacific Flyway. And this um, flooding and circulation helps flush salt and decaying material. So um, it happens, uh, the major cycle of this flooding and cir circulation hap happens in early October this every year. So it's happening right now. We've got a lot of staff and, um, and stakeholders and RCD working now in the field trying to prevent occurrences of this low DO because what you see here is that um, green line indicates it's a 
daily the daily average DO and how it changes after these um, discharges begin. So um, af uh, after um, realizing, you know, what is causing the low DO in the marsh, I felt really good about it, and I thought half of my project was done. But then pretty soon I realized that I really didn't have the right tools to truly evaluate the extent of impact of this low DO on aquatic organisms. We also evaluated the available nutrient data and the nutrient indicators that um, Eric mentioned to you. And um, we couldn't find any direct link or significant impact on the, of the nutrient load, which does exist in Tishun Marsh, on lowering of DO. So this is a, a little bit of a phenomenon that is linked to a specific water management that is um, like that is done in the marsh. Um, so, um, so then we decided really to develop the site-specific objectives for DO that apply that would apply specifically to the marsh sluice, and the scientific approach to do so uh, was adopted from the EPA um, uh, method um, developed uh, for the East Coast in 2000. And um, this method, um, or um, the e it was the first time actually when the EPA proposed the um, criteria for the soft oxygen that apply to estuarine waters with a goal to maintain and protect aquatic life beneficial uses and also to support derivation of region specific and species specific um, DO objectives. So in the process of develop, developing the objectives for Sassoon Marsh, we um, relied heavily on the expert panel recommendations. Uh, first, to select this particular approach to calculate the objectives, and second, to, um, to uh, employ the method and its underlying assumptions. And um, many of you might be familiar with um, with this uh, calculation because the derivation of the DO objective sort of follows a method that is similar to derivation of the objectives for toxic pollutants. So basically in the calculation of the DO criteria, we use the lab available laboratory data in which uh, the uh, aquatic organisms are exposed to different um, uh, periods of low DO. And, um, as a result, the calculated acute limit is based on lethality, and the, um, the chronic objective is linked to um, growth. Okay, so the first step in the calculation of the criteria was actually to, um, to look at the um, Sassoon Marsh uh, fishes and to find fishes that spent a significant or critical portions of the um, life history in Sassoon Marsh, and then use and then compare these fishes to the EPA database of available DO tolerance data. And if, when we were lucky enough to have more than one study for the same fish, we basically screened the data for um, the uh, most sensitive life stages, like larval stages in the case of DO, or um, uh, the longest exposure period. But basically, we didn't expect to find all Sassoon Marsh species in the EPA database. And again, relied on the expert panel suggestions to pick the 22 species or the surrogates um, that, according to our fish expert, Professor Peter Moyle from um, UC Davis, really provided a quite a good characterization of the uh, organisms present in Sassoon Marsh. And then we use these 22 species to calculate our objectives. So ultimately, um, our objectives, of course, are, are most affected by the most sensitive species that you see on the right here. And you can also notice that the top four most sensitive species used in the calculation of acute and chronic thresholds are not necessarily the same. And this is because these organisms may um, may uh, show different responses depending on the time of exposure. Um, okay. um, 
finally, this is an example of the um, of our objectives that we um, proposed and uh, that were adopted for uh, for Sassoon Marsh. Uh, we have acute and chronic thresholds that apply to all sluice and marshes, all sluice and channels throughout the year. And we've got also one more chronic, more stringent chronic objective of 6.4 milligrams per liter that um, is specifically designed to protect juvenile salmonids out migrating from the freshwater streams to the estuary. And this objective only applies to selected flows during the spring, January through April. So now is the time to sort of take a step back and look at all of this. And I would say that it took us a very long time to come up with the list of species to calculate the objectives, but after eventually when we decided that this is it. It was somewhat straightforward um, to use the EPA models to uh, and using the Tetratec expertise, because Tetratec helped us on, on this project, to calculate these thresholds. What was challenging, though, was how we were going to apply these thresholds so we can, we can ensure that aquatic life beneficial units are protected. And here, I think, the, um, the arm waving would be necessary. <laughs> that animation would be helpful here because we did a lot of that with the experts. Um, so to help with this challenge, we um, first we use the reference condition approach, um, which I'm going to show you next. Um, basically, we use the um, available data, continuous data for the minimally impacted first and mallard, first and second mallard sluice in the marsh and compared the data to the threshold. We also did the same comparison um, for, uh, for the Goodyear slough, which is our focus impacted slough in the western portion of the marsh. And here you, see, you can see a, an example, a comparison of DO concentrations between the Goodyear slough shown in green and the mallard sluice for the critical month of October 2012. And as you can see, for half of the month, um, the concentrations in Goodyear slough are somewhat comparable with, um, with the Mallard slough. But the picture becomes quite different towards the end of the month when we had these um, uh, discharges from managed wetlands reaching Goodyear slough. Um, so again, to uh, further tailor the objective to Sassoon Marsh, we, um, we compared, we tested a, a, a range of averaging periods and moving and block averages to, uh, based on the data from these minimally impacted mallard sloughs. Um, the goal of this comparison was really to, uh, to find out or to define what would be the um, what, what could be considered as uh, naturally attainable DO concentrations in this reference sluice. So we had um, really an excellent um, uh, set of data from 2008 through, through 2016. And you may remember 2011 was an exceptionally uh, wet year. And of course, 2014, 15, and 16 were really critically dry years. Years. So we had a range of conditions um, uh, with DO, with good DO data, and we did the same comparison for good year slow for 2015 and 2016 because we already knew that the previous years were really bad. So as you can see from this comparison, uh, really there is some level of exceedance of DO concentrations or DO thresholds for every. Uh, uh, averaging period tested. But again, with a lot of more arm waving, uh, we sort of decided together or we get an agreement that the daily average and 30-day um, moving average uh, were um, the best um, averaging period uh, that we could use to interpret these objectives. Firstly, because um, uh, these um, one day and 30 day averages were comparable to the uh, periods of exposure that were available 
uh, in, the uh, in the EPA database, so they were used to calculate the objectives. And also, um, uh, we proposed using a 30-day moving average um, with one day time step uh, to make sure that when we calculate these averages, we are able to detect a worsening of the condi DO conditions a little bit faster uh, if we com compare to the fact when we would use the, um, the block average. And also, we didn't want really to, um, to use the um, averaging period or, a, or a, uh, our calculation method that would result in 100% of um, meeting the objective. Um, I think everyone in this room knows that you can't really predict the nature. We can work, or I've been working in the marsh for a, for a reasonable amount of time. I wouldn't even try to convince you that I know everything about DO in the marsh or how, this, um, uh, how the DO would change in any particular slough. So, uh, we agreed with the expert that it would be a good idea to allow for some minimum level of exceedances in this even naturally or minimally impacted sloughs because this is how the nature sort of teaches us to, um, to look at the environmental data. So we also looked at um, some uh, presence and absence of uh, fish in the um, sloughs throughout the year. And this was to decide whether we needed to consider seasonality uh, in establishing the objectives. And we had, this time we had like 25 years of abandoned, fish abundance data to do this analysis, even if it looks so simple <laughs> here. Um, and um, as you can see from this comparison, um, really fish is present in these flows throughout the year with maybe one exception, which is the um, salmonids that seem to be absent uh, from the sluice May through December, but really abandoned February through March. So again, we use this logic to, uh, uh, to, uh, to decide that um, our general objectives should apply to all uh, sluice and channels throughout the year, and it's appropriate to use this more stringent objective to protect juvenile salmonids. Uh, while true DO tolerance uh, of fishes in Sassoon Marsh is not really well understood, and I think it's going to stay this, this way for a long time, um, with this analysis, we basically try to figure out whether our thresholds are um, in agreement with general fish preferences in the marsh. So what we did, we looked at the um, presence and absence or the catch levels of various uh, important native and non-native um, fish species as a function of salinity and um, dissolved oxygen. And we did this kind of analysis for many different combinations of fish and, um, and sloughs. And you have um, here only just a snapshot of the analysis that we did. And um, basically what all the um, graphs or all the plots convey um, is that our lower level um, threshold of uh, 3.8 milligrams per liter is an appropriate um, uh, objective for the marsh <coughs> because fish, as you can see here, is hardly so this is uh, 3.8 and 5, 3.8 and 5. So the fish is hardly present at the concentrations below 3.8 milligrams per liter, and as could be expected, is more and more abundant at higher concentrations. Well, maybe with one exception, and this is for this little this fine stickleback, which seems to be thriving at the 2.5 milligrams per liter in Goodyear's flow of all the flows. So. Um, from the literature, we know that at two milligrams per liter, two milligrams per liter is usually considered as um, uh, indicative of really hypoxic conditions. Fish kills can happen, and you know, huge in, uh, causing huge impairments. But in the marsh, the marsh cannot be boxed, cannot be ruled. You know, there are different conditions or different things that can, can happen in, in the marsh. So. Um. <coughs> 
it teaches be teaches you to be humble. <laughs> um, okay, so with the uh, site specific objectives in place, um, I was finally able to propose a TMDL, total maximum daily load. But again, we don't have nutrient experiments. DO is really something that we all need. So um, it's not your typical pollutant. So we proposed a concentration based TMDL for the marsh um, in which the the objectives or the targets, the TMDL and the allocations are all equivalent to the site specific objective. And in this case, um, the sources of low DO, like managed wetlands or municipal wastewater or stormwater, in order to meet the allocations, they have to meet the water quality objectives in the but they have to meet these water quality objectives in the receiving water, so in the source. So this makes it very simple for everyone to understand what they have to do, um, and it's easy to monitor. And also, uh, for us, uh, it provides an additional level of insurance, basically, that uh, because we want these water quality objectives to be met in the, in the sluice, then that also means that the sluice will provide the right environment for the uh, aquatic life beneficiaries. Okay, you see? <laughs> I told you. <laughs> we lost it. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, could you show just the presentation? <laughs> not the, not this. Uh, not this slide. Ah, so sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Just one more slide. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So, okay. So the next two slides were supposed to show you how the um, DO concentrations changed from how this um, how we use the this new this new matrix to um to interpret the continuous do data that we've been collecting in the marsh uh from uh since 2012 and how the do improved over the years because of the best management practices that we've been deploying and the other thing i wanted to show you was the example of application of this um objective to a uh, to DO data in Albisa Slu in the um, Lower South Bay, and um, basically to compare these two um, water bodies. And um, also, uh, we've got an idea that the um, objectives that were developed, uh, or the approach that was used to develop the objectives to, uh, in Sisun Marsh, might be applicable to other sluice as well. And just in conclusion, uh, so our new objectives uh, are really um, tailored to the conditions in the marsh and the, the species that use the marsh. Uh, although we didn't have all the data in the EPA database to calculate the objectives for Sisun Marsh, there is still enough information there, there to provide for um, a meaningful substitute. Uh, because we derive the objectives from the direct physiological uh, effect data, it makes them really um, applicable uh, and protective. And now we've got the tools to use the, um, the continuous data that everyone has been collecting to um, um, interpret this continuous data and to um, decide whether we are um, improving our uh, water quality in the marsh. And finally, uh, I think the approach that we developed could be applied elsewhere, like in um, Lower South Bay. And 
with that, I would like to acknowledge the collaborators of the project and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Everyone, please hold your questions till the panel um, at the end. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Zhenlin Zhang, um, who received her PhD from uh, the School of Earth and Environment at the University of Western Australia in 2011. She joined SFEI in 2017 as a water quality mo modeler, and her work focuses on applying and developing numerical models to understand factors controlling nutrients and phytoplankton dynamics in San Francisco Bay. Good afternoon, everyone. So today in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the progress we've made at SCPI um, during last year on using numerical models to, analyze, to analyze the factors controlled by the plants and blues in San Francisco Bay. So this is San Francisco Bay, and now we're focusing on Lower South Bay. The USGS Polaris crews have records of Fuel le level, which is the proxy for phytoplankton biomass along the bay. Now, for this particular presentation, I'm going to focus on this historical bloom event in 2013, where chlorophyll A level reaches 160 micrograms per liter, which is about eight times the historical average for that particular month. So, why do we care about phytoplankton blooms? San Francisco Bay receives a large amount of nutrients from wastewater treatment plants, and for a majority part of, ta majority part of the year, and th the nutrients would be transported outside of the bay without causing a harm. However, the presence of high nutrient level um, under right conditions has the potential to fuel a high phytoplankton bloom event. Now, having phytoplankton bloom may not necessarily be a bad thing, However, when phytoplankton dies, um, the, the respiration of the dead material consumes dissolved oxygen in the water, which can lead to low DO issue. And the low DO uh, issue can result in negative impact like fish kill that Barbara just explained in her slide. So at the same time, the elevated level of phytoplankton biomass, together with other conditions like high temperature or long resistance time, can also result in higher risk of harmful algae blooms. So in order to break the, tra break the tra chain reaction from high level of nutrient input and negative water quality impacts, we need to understand exactly under what condition a bloom can be initiated, what controls the peak, and what eventually terminates the bloom. So let's first focus on phytoplankton. What factors controls phytoplankton biomass for any given time or location? Phytoplankton needs nutrients and light to grow. The limited availability of either nutrients or light can result in reduced growth of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton also has predators, um, the, the zooplankton or the grazers. When a zooplankton is abundant, phytoplankton growth can be, phytoplankton biomass May, we may not be able to observe, observe increase in phytoplankton biomass even when phytoplankton growth rate is really high. And this is because the additional phytoplankton growth may be co completely consumed by grazers. So these are the processes happening at one location and time. There are processes that happening elsewhere can also affect phytoplankton biomass observed at this location. The transport. The transport is really important because just because you observe high phytoplankton biomass at this particular location does not mean the phytoplankton was generated all locally. It could have been produced elsewhere and then transported in this location to this location. Or on the country, just because you have high production of phytoplankton does not mean that we're going to observe a bloom event because the production can be Really, most of the production can be tra just transported to other places and disappear. So, a laundry list of processes of factors controlling phytoplankton um, biomass include nutrients, light, 
transport, and grazing. To capture all these processes, we need a coupled hydrodynamic and biogeochemical um, approach. The biogeochemical model captures all the in-situ processes that I have discussed in the previous slide. And the hydrodynamic model resolves the flow and mixing throughout the day. I'd like to emphasize the transport term does not only mean flow, it actually means the transport of mass by the flow in the unit of concentration times the flow rate. The transport includes three terms. Advection means the movement of mass from one location to the next by the flow. Whereas the dispersion and mixing has a net effect for transporting mass from high concentration region to low concentration. However, one more focus on horizontal direction, basically dispersion by tide, and the other focusing more on the vertical direction along the wall column. So we're applying this type of modeling approach to San Francisco Bay, and now I'm going to show you the results from the model for this particular lower South Sea location on the, the, the top surface shell where the bloom was observed. This is our modeling results. Um, the solid line represents the daily average value from the model. The shaded area represents the daily range from the model, and the circles represent the observation value. You can see that our model is doing a really good job in capturing that historical bloom event at this particular location. Our model is also able to capture um, the spatial distribution of chlorophyll A both during the bloom event and the non-bloom event. So this, again, on this slide, the circle represents observation and the color contour represents our modeling results. And one interesting thing I noticed is that the Polaris crews largely miss those most interesting areas where high quality bloom um, concentration were observed, such as the show area in the South Bay and San Pablo Bay. That means that to further validate our model performance in this region, we need to measure chlorophyll A at those locations. And starting from 2017, SFEI has deployed moving of moving, uh, sem um, sensors at this particular location in South Bay to record um, water quality and, and environmental conditions, including chlorophyll A level. So our future modeling results, um, modeling work can be better improved with this particular mooring de deployed at this location. So the model can do more than just capturing a historical bloom event. We can use the model as a diagnostic tool to actually investigate what factors cause this bloom event. Plotted on this figure, the gray, the gray line at the bright background shows the shape of the bloom so that we know when it starts and when it ends. And the dark line here represents the time rate change of chlorophyll A. So the positive value represents the bloom is growing whereas the negative value represents the phytoplankton concentration is decreasing. So from the model output, we can actually identify, separate each of those factors and identify how they contribute to this particular bloom event. First plot is, plot is the nutrient, and then light, and then the transport. Lastly, the grazing term. So now we're focusing first on the initiation phase of the bloom. And if we first look at the nutrient, which is the green line at the top, we can see that when the bloom starts, there's abundance of nutrient. So that means nutrient is not the reason the bloom starts. And then let's focus on um, both light and transport. And light shows this upward trend that's coinciding with the occurrence of the bloom. So light is an important reason why the bloom was initiated. And the impact of transport shows there's a negative trend. That means that the water is moving nutrients from this location to other places. So it's in the opposite direction of the bloom growth. So transport is not the reason the bloom starts. Lastly, having light does not necessarily lead to bloom events. Grazer plays a very important role. What you can see is that at the beginning of the bloom, the grazing pressure is very low. There's a very low abundance of zooplankton in the system. 
and having very low abundance of, of zooplankton is a very important condition because that when the bloom takes, takes off, there's no external constraint to prevent it from happening. So the lack of grazers is another reason that why the bloom was initiated. Now let's focus on the peak of the bloom. First, let's look at nutrient. The shady area again represents the daily, daily range. And we can see that at least during some part of the day, the nutrient limitation plays an extremely important role in limiting um, the phytoplankton growth. So nutrient is an important factor controlling the peak of the bloom. Second, the light. Again, at this moment, during the peak of the bloom, we see that light limitation factor reduced to about 0 0.25, which is a very low light limitation value. That means that during the peak of the bloom, light is also important. Third, the transport. The fact that the transport remains negative means that the water is actually moving mass out of the system. And that means that transport is also an important factor in just controlling the phytoplankton bloom event during the peak as well. Lastly, grazing. During the peak of the bloom, we can see that the grazing pressure remains pretty low. So grazers are not an important factor in con controlling the peak. Last, let's focus on the bloom termination phase. Exactly this moment, from this moment on, bloom starts to decline. We can see that at this moment, both light and nutrient, there's a bunch of light and nutrients. So obviously, neither light or nutrients are the reason that the bloom was terminated. The transport turn goes up and down, but on average, it, it doesn't seem to have like a strong correspondence with the sharp decline of bloom. So transport is also not important. Lastly, what seems to show a really strong correlation with that sharp decline in phytoplankton biomass is the grazers. So grazing is the reason why the bloom was finally terminated. So if we summarize, for this particular historical event, the bloom was initiated as the increased light and the low, phyto, low zooplankton. And the peak was, caused by, was controlled by light and nutrient limitation as well as transport. And lastly, the bloom was terminated because of the increased grazing pressure. Since the motivation of this study was nutrient related, we want to understand what if we add more nutrient into the system. So this is a hypothetical run that the model was forced with 10 times more nutrient loading. And we can see that our modeling results showed a very similar shape of the bloom event. However, the amplitude was over 1,000 microgram per liter, which is about eight times um, the measure observation value. So that's a really interesting finding because if we add more nutrients into the system, then we have the potential of even fewer higher bloom, or if there's nutrient management action that the purpose is to decrease the nutrient loading, then we're gonna see its impact in controlling the phytoplankton bloom. And next, when I first got this modeling result, I got asked a lot of questions on zooplankton, the role of zooplankton. Since we do not have any measurement data, people question, how do you know zooplankton is actually important? So one way to test it out is to remove zooplankton from my model. And now I'm getting ranges from about 40 to about 160 microgram per liter throughout the year, except during the winter period when light was limiting. So this is obviously not the condition we observed here in San Francisco Bay. Great. Um, so far, I have demonstrated the corovial level as well Corovial A level as well as the diagnostic terms for this one particular lower South Bay location and only at the surface. I just want to emphasize that our model is a three-dimensional model and we can output peripheral A concentration as well as all the technical, technical information for any location and time. So this is 
uh, animation that I made. I'm going to show you this three-dimensional view of um, this, this small region in Lower South Bay during the Bloom event. So the movement of a grid represents the water level change. The color represents the chlorophyll A concentrations. So now we're in the peak of the bloom. So to conclude, in this presentation, I have demonstrated how we can use a coupled physical and biogeochemical approach to not only reproduce a bloom event, but also to dissect what factors causes initiation, what controls the peak, and what causes the termination of the bloom event. I would just like to emphasize this is just only one project that we're doing here at SBI. We also apply this approach to other parts, um, including the delta region, and we're also going to apply this approach to the more detailed blue and ponds region in Lower South Bay. So this is the end of my presentation. Let me know if you have any questions. In order to make up some time, we're going to ask you to keep your questions for the panel at the end. So um, I'm going to move along to um, our final speaker in this session, uh, Dr. David Sten. Um, Dave is a senior scientist at SFEI and co-director of uh, the SFEI's Clean Water Program and lead scientist for the Bay Nutrient Management Program. That's a lot of, uh, lot of titles there, Dave. Um, he received a BS in civil and environmental engineering from Rutgers University and his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from MIT. Dave joined SFEI in 2011 and has research interests that focus on biogeochemistry, state and transport of nutrients and trace metals, metalloids in lakes, rivers, wetlands, and estuarine or marine systems. And Dave will be uh, presenting on harmful algae in San Francisco Bay. Thanks, Eric, and thanks for the invitation to present today. So I wanted to start off first by just acknowledging a number of contributors and collaborators on this project um, from across USGS, UC Santa Cruz, funding with the Bay Management Strategy and the Monitoring Program. So around this time last year, October, summer of last year, we were faced with this, or not last year, sorry, blah, blah. And it was, it was, it was a pretty scary thing to think about. We have a system where uh, this organism, Pseudonychia, that produces domoic acid, which is responsible for cell meter shellfish poisoning, was hanging out off offshore. Um, based on everything we know, San Francisco Bay is a system where it could do quite well uh, in terms of the light, temperature, et cetera, all this that Lynn was just naming. It also would be able to take really good advantage of all the nutrients there. And, and there was grave concern that we would have a, a major event. Uh, we know that it caused the closure of the shellfish fishery. Off of the off the coast, the Dungeness crab fishery. Who knows what the effects would have been inside the bay? Um, fortunately, at that time, we had a postdoc jointly between Jim Thorne's group at USGS, at Grace Cadell's group at UC Santa Cruz, and our group at SFBI, who was studying toxins in algae. And she had the forethought to go out and set up an established network of mussel stations around uh, Central Bay. And so this is just a collection of stations. All, all throughout Central Bay, and starting in April of that year, going out and collecting monthly samples. And what we saw right as that blob was hanging offshore was a, a substantial and consistent uptick across all the sites in domoic acid concentrations increased and then we've been bouncing around a bit more, but nothing that would come close to what we would expect with this type of 
concentrations in organisms offshore were orders of magnitude higher. And so there, there's, a, there's a real concern and threat as these types of ontological blooms become more prevalent um, that we may find ourselves needing to deal and manage those and manage the system and think about how we plan for the system in a very different way and event based on typical conditions. Um, San Francisco Bay has high nutrient loads, high nutrient concentrations, as both Eric and Jen Lin mentioned. The nitrogen and phosphorus loads place the bay in the upper 90th percentile of, of estuaries worldwide. Concentrations in the bay exceed those recently up world water, so there's plenty of nutrients for things like Tsubamichi or other phytoplankton to take advantage of. And in 2012, the Water Board established the Nutrient Management Study. And the key questions that that nutrient management study aims to answer is what nutrient loads can the bay assimilate without adverse impacts? What management actions are effective at uh, protecting nutrient loads or concentrations? There's obviously a lot underneath each one of those questions. I'm going to talk about one of those topics today. Um, and that's going to be harmful algae and cytotoxins, algal toxins. Uh, the, the questions, see from here too. Um, the, the questions that, that we're aiming to answer, first of all, just, we knew that there were toxins in this system. We knew that there were harmful algae in this system. Um, but we really did not have an idea of what that meant in terms of the, the health of the system. Is this like every other estuary, or is this something new? And so we had a question of, is, there, is, this, is, there, is this a substantial issue in the Bay? Um, is there a major harmful algae or, or cytotoxin threat? Um, what would be the sensitive population? Uh, marine biota, humans, um, there isn't a very, very big fishery in the Bay Area, but there are people who use it to um, do subsistence collection of, of, of bivalves. Um, and also current versus future conditions. We know what the system looks like now. We know what the system has looked like over the last 40 years because of intensive research over that time period. But what will, what will as, as various physical forces change in the system, might there be changes to harmful algal um, abundance and toxin production? Um, what we're concerned about are things like toxic algae produce, growing and producing toxins those getting into primary consumers and then co being concentrated in primary consumers and having effects on secondary and tertiary consumers. We, we know HABs are increasingly important water quality issue worldwide, and we know there are indications that the bay is at least not immune. We know the organism is present, we see the toxins, um, and is, do we understand the problem well enough to know how to manage? Um, what factors regulate harmful algal abundance and toxicity? They could be transported in, there could be in situ production of them. And really understanding that and answering that is it's at the it's at the forefront or the edge of what phytoplankton ecologists do, do this at, for basic research. Um, what we currently understand isn't going to quite get us to be able to answer that question. So we're we're really pushing the edge from a management and applied science program. That's why it's so valuable that we're working with people who study this on a regular basis. Um, but a, a harmful algae require well, their growth will, and whether they can take off will depend on light availability, temperature, salinity, mixing, and nutrients. There's also the potential for input from various other systems into San Francisco Bay, as well as from the coastal ocean. Uh, if phytoplankton are growing inside the bay, sorry, not phytoplankton, harmful algae are growing inside the bay and toxins, um, is there a role of the nutrients in San Francisco Bay, these excess nutrients from, from largely wastewater treatment plant loads? And lastly, what would be protective nutrient loads with respect to algae? Um, there's a number of organisms out there. You know, you know of any of them. That I was just talking about Pseudomychia and vanillic acid. There's Microcystis, which produces Microcystin, more of a freshwater organism. Saxitoxin, which uh, produced by Alexandrium, which causes pyrolytic shellfish poisoning. And they produce toxins. It's a, very complex to understand all the factors that cause them to produce toxins, but some of the things we know is that they, they, they get toxic just like us when they get stressed. And so <laughs> changes in salinity, abrupt changes in salinity or temperature, either too much nutrients might cause them to produce more of a toxin, like a nitrogen-rich vanillic acid, or when they run out, they might get cranky and produce toxins, and changes in light conditions. Um, if we want to be able to understand the effects in this system, and we want to be able to effectively inform management decisions, what data and tools do we need to really do that? 
Um, one of the things that we're really fortunate to have is this ongoing and 40-year record of extra research by the Central Bank. Um, we've been working with Jim, fortunate to be able to work with Jim Clarence Group, as well as collaborating with Ray Cadella at UC Santa Cruz. And the nutrient management strategy has, has augmented the, the funding and, and research effort to be, allow for more consistent measurements of phytoplankton uh, taxonomy by microscopy, as well as recently with PR and the measurement of algal toxins. We also, following up on the, the postdoc Misty's uh, initiative of setting up this network of muscle sampling stations throughout the Bay, for the last three years, we've been sampling on a bi-weekly basis at all these sites on floating docks. And this is an example of what they look like. I just heard last week, though, that they're starting to run dry. So our, 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 our chief solution to monitor and toxins maybe they need to start looking for other places. So what I'm showing here are, is the mullic acid concentration in these mussels. The colored dots are representative of these different regions of the bay. The mullic acid is plotted on the y-axis, a log scale, at parts per billion. And from roughly September 2015 through, um, through March of 2018. And I, I keep staring at these a lot. And as I stare at them more and more, I, I finally think I there, there's, there's, there's a lot of noise, um, and it's also a log scale, and that amplifies some of the noise. But one of the things, one of the reasons we established this pretty expansive network, and it looks like there's a fair bit of potential redundancy, we wanted to not just assess what's going into the food web, but we wanted to try to use it as well to inform our mechanistic understanding of, of where these genes are taking off, where toxins are being produced. For example, if you were to see increase in concentrations earlier in South Bay than you saw in the North and much higher concentrations. You might be able to make an inference that Cubanichi is growing and producing toxins in South Bay, gradually moving into. So this is demonic acid. We're also measuring saxitoxin. Um, saxitoxin was, was lower during the, the past year, and then in, in March of 2018, saxitoxin concentrations actually rose above this 800 parts per billion regulatory threshold for, for species resulted in Alameda County posting that, that people shouldn't be if they were consuming shellfish that they should um, and but so there's there's actually much higher concentrations of this than we expected uh, we were we thought that because that we hadn't been aware of an issue that that there was perhaps not one and this is just evidence that we one of the reasons that there may not have just weren't looking weren't doing the and lastly, I'm showing microcystin here, and this microcystin has a regulatory uh, consumption threshold or a guidance level of 10 parts per billion. Microcystin, I mentioned earlier, is produced by the freshwater algae, uh, freshwater cyanobacteria, microcystis. Um, and surprisingly, we see consistently elevated microcystin throughout San Francisco, throughout San Francisco Bay. Um, Something that's really difficult for us to get our heads around is any one of these toxins may be problematic or maybe it's not problematic. But what about combination, mixture of toxins? And especially for organisms that might be having consistent diet off of uh, marine organisms. So um, what we know now, we know that there are multiple phycotoxins regularly affecting biota. Uh, I, I just showed you demolic acid, microcystin, saxitoxin. Um, Misty's paper also described Mosaic acid measurements and elevated opodaic acid. We know there's regularly regularly detected phycotoxins in water, both in fluid and dissolved, and regularly detected in multiple harmful ta taxa. And there's a real we we really want to get to the bottom of understanding what is causing this to happen and whether there's a root a nutrient related role. So one of the things we set out to do was decided what can we learn mechanistically about harmful algae and by looking. Um, we have a really lengthy, excellent record going back to 1992 of harmful algae stuff. This is showing five of them that I'll be touching on in the rest of the talk. And this is showing the bubble size here going from 1995 to 2015 is showing um, the, the cells per milliliter. And these are all sites that collapsed on the basis of the entire sample. Okay. But can we learn anything about the sources or determine whether they're whether they're growing internally, understand whether we have resident populations, and maybe predict the conditions under which these organisms might grow. 
Um, one of the ways that we thought about pursuing this was essentially exploring this data set and developing conceptual models and then testing those conceptual models. For example, if there was an organism that was primarily coming in through the Golden Gate and having a very short sweet stay, for example, <coughs> to survey and dying, well, their abundance or their frequency of detection might be greater than today, lower elsewhere. The other, uh, the other extremes are organisms that might be growing inside the bay more from the freshwater or, or more saline end members. Another way that we thought about approaching this is if they're growing in the bay, do we see these organisms' abundance increasing or we detect them more frequently during conditions that are optimum? I'll come back to what I mean by that. And lastly, by looking at the time series of these organisms and perhaps some of the co-occurrence of these organisms in time and when, when they take off, and then also look for how that compares with various physical forces by a group of just growth. Can we learn something about what causes them to, um, to, to take off? Um, so what I'm showing here is just a scarier graphic than, than it actually is. Um, <laughs> This is each of the sub embayments in San Francisco Bay where we pulled stations, and then each one of these is, is a row representing each one of these organisms. And the organisms that I have underlined there are the true nasty. Um, the others are maybe they have someone in their family that's a toxic algae, or maybe they're just, it's just built by association. But we, we're looking at these organisms here as well, and I'm going to just show you where they light up, where they have shown up. This is now showing where did those where were those organisms detected in time. Again, not all of them are especially are toxic, but we, we wanted to also look at ones that may co-vary with them. I'm going to simplify this down a bit and, for, and just look now at Alexandrium, Prorocentrum, et cetera. And Alexandrium is the truly, <coughs> the truly problematic one, but we started looking through this data and noticing some interesting features, just looking at the in South Bay, and it's started to become apparent that every time that Alexandrium shows very frequently procentrum, um, as well, very frequently heterocastrum. Um, and it becomes really evident as you start picking through it. And I was working with a colleague in our group, Taylor, as I was showing him some of these plots where I had these spread out in more different ways. He came up with a way of consolidating this and allows us to see it a lot more easily. Um, the, what I'm going to go from here is this is just presence absence. This is now showing the density of cells. And so again, in these areas where there's where one of them takes off, the others also take off. It almost, as I look at this, it almost I can almost feel them coming out of the sediment, little little volcano. Um, the, <laughs> but you can see them all co-varying, or or some amount of co-variance, or at least the eyeball test. So before you want to dive into a more sophisticated statistical analysis. But this, do we see something here that, that might make sense? Um, and then we started asking, well, what might be some of these factors that affect the contributing to or causing this? And so we plotted flow rate from Alameda Creek on, on this, this axis here, and then chlorophyll in milligrams per meter cube. And one of the things that begins to pop out here is that when there's a major flow event, and when there's a major reduction of phytoplankton as chlorophyll goes up, these organisms also, so coming back to the point that I was mentioning before, if we are looking for, if we're asking the question, are these organisms growing internally in the bay? We want to look for conditions that favor growth of other phytoplankton, and then see whether or not they also off on. Um, something that I don't know if any of you noticed something interesting about this plot, where and Alexandrium. I thought it focused very much over here before, and but then we started looking. Oh out here in the distance or in more recent times, Alexander has gone away. And so is that has this system once again made a shift and we're now seeing different types of organisms co-varying. Um, it even becomes more apparent when you add these other sub embayments back in, see this place where there's virtually a virtual absence action. Um, and then as we thought about it a bit more, this actually coincides with the time when the long-term <laughs> record, there was a deliberate shift from one taxonomist who's been working with the program for since its inception to a different taxonomist. And that organism, which is a really important one for our regulatory issues, um, it, it, it appeared. Um, fortunately, we kind of taught this enough, and we also fortunately have been archiving some samples, some extra filters. And so we did a, a pilot sequencing 
where we print everything that's in there and look at who's present, and including, including um, Alexandria. And what we found is that the site, like we didn't run all of these samples inside that box, we did fewer, but inside this box, that we in 30 to, oops, in 30 to 30 to 90 percent of the samples, we 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 were able to detect Alexandrium. So Alexandrium is still there. <laughs> That's um, and so Alexandrium is still there, and but and, and it, I, we're we're feeling fortunate that we actually had this ability to go back and, and test that method, and as we move towards towards refining others. Um, the last thing I wanted to, me to mention briefly was coming back to point here is if we look at if we look at all, a, a number of different clumpal algal phosphorus and we plot them against chlorophyll on the x-axis whether or not they were detected and dissolved oxygen on the y-axis so phytoplankton when they when they're being degraded by bacteria oxygen is lost and they photosynthesize it to produce oxygen so if the water column is super saturated with oxygen and there's high chlorophyll you're in a place where that, there's high, rapid growth and so what we looked at here, and this is a bit of a patient with me for a second here. This is, as an example, I'm showing you here. <laughs> um, the, so, the, so what I'm showing here is Palastiosira, a healthy diet. So this is responsible for many of the blooms in the bay. And so we wanted to look at Palastiosira in the framework. And so we have street chlorophyll on the x-axis, oxygen on the y-axis, and then this is the upper quartile of, the, of, chlor, of chlorophyll is over in this quadrant up here and above 100%. And what we see for an organism that is responsible for many of the blooms in San Francisco Bay, but not surprisingly, it's present when the blooms are and it's And this diamond means that it's in its upper 25th percentile of abundance. We can then go and look at some of the other taxa. Alexandrium on the top, Carnosinium, Indonesia, Dinophysis, and ask, where does Alexandrium show up most frequently? Show up in not growth or bridge growth? That one I think I already gave away the answer in the last example. But we see Alexandrium frequently in the elevated chlorophyll and also in periods where the growth <coughs> active active growth is. Um, and then Carlosinium. Well, maybe it's growing a little bit over here too, but not quite as, as obvious. Pseudonychia, the other one that we're really care are really curious and caring about, is occasionally it finds its way up here, but most often it, it is elsewhere. Uh, this, I, I, actually, I should reserve judgment. There's, um, I think that depending on where you look and the time of year, it might find itself here. But, um, so, with that, just wanted to summarize that. The bay has nutrient concentrations that are sufficiently high that adverse impacts could occur if those nutrients. Um, the things we're concerned about and need to be on the lookout for, you know, large phytoplankton, OBO, large scale hazard, and understanding what the triggers are. The nutrient management strategy is targeting the highest priority science needs, for management systems. Again, the Absorbing species are commonly detected, toxins are commonly detected, and they're at levels that we can't just dismiss them. Minimum. And but really trying to get a handle on this challenging technical issue to address, but they're highly relevant to management. We need to come up with a framework that allows us to move this forward. Maybe we can get knock some ideas down and we don't need to worry about them, but we need to recognize them. Um, and with that, I'll thanks again. Yeah. Well, no, I'll, I'll, we're going to do the panel now, so might as well stay up here. So can I have uh, Barbara and uh, Shenlin come up, please? And um, we, can, uh, we can take questions. Don. Oh hi! I have a question for Jen Lin. Um, your your grazing rate is that um, kind of derived from first principles, and and can you is there a good way to kind of validate it empirically? You know, is it a fitting parameter on the model, or you know, how how do you get that grazing rate? Oh, 
So, <laughs> so the grazing rate is modeled as a, like a functional field environmental factors, in, including the concentration of bird fuel and the zooplankton biomass itself, and structure and the mortality of zooplankton. And so it's actually dynamically modeled. Modeled. Um, yeah. So in order, I mean, there's no way to actually ground truth the, the correctness of the parameters. The only way to find it out is to run the model, tune the parameters, and feel the observation matches the model. And I do um, acknowledge that there's definitely uncertainty in our model in terms of multiple choices of parameters may produce very similar results. So the only way to test it out is to be able to perform the similar analysis for multiple years. So you can find like one set of parameters works for this year, reproducing bloom triggered by this specific kind of condition, and also works for a different year, either like producing a bloom or reproduce that there's no bloom, then we have more confidence. So it's going to be an iterative process. Would there be a way to like grab, grab a liter of water and count so the fact that there's something that tells you, oh, this is realistic or magnitude? Well, I, I thought it's definitely possible, like to do some sort of lab experiment based on like a um, water water samples. But I found those kind of water samples are highly um, like inaccurate. In, sometimes inaccurate. Others, like if you grab water sample here, the condition may be different from say 100 meters away. And then there's also the issue that the lab condition may not be the same as this condition, because in in San Francisco Bay, you know that there are a lot of Factors like stability, for instance, it's gonna constantly affect the light field. And if you grab that water, put it in the lab, and suppose you give a different light condition, then whatever you measure may not really be representative of what field. Can I just follow up on that real quick? So, it, it, and it, although it's never gonna be a perfect uh, jump from knowing abundances and even knowing grazing rates of, that go along with those abundances and to put it into a model, uh, we or parameterize it correctly in a model. We, once we did start seeing these results about the importance of the grazing pressure, we started a study to begin collecting bi-weekly samples of zooplankton and counting at least with the idea that we'll at least have the abundances and the taxonomy, and then with the intent that gradually we may move, move towards some feeding studies with better constraints. Other questions? Anyone? Question about the role of clam grazing in the Lower South Bay. Um, for this, for our model, at the moment we do not have grazers there, but I definitely think that grazers can play a very important role. Um, and, and the difference between grazers, which is like a bamboo grazer and zooplankton, which is a flagger grazer, is that clams does not move with water. So, and also it doesn't respond as fast as zooplankton in terms of growth, like growth rate. And one impact that's not modeled here, but I can totally see can be really important, is that say at the beginning of the bloom, there are pre-existing clams in the water system. And because they're already there, they can start to take down the blooms and actually prevent the bloom from happening. So yeah, I definitely think that clams will be something, will be, can be quite important factor if we have not considered it for study yet. It wasn't really clear to me what was causing that really peak bloom, such because it's really only a short period of time, right? And, but what was the model predicting? Was it just light or lack of turbidity? It wasn't clear to me. Um, you mean why it's grow? Why it was so high in the onset? Why it's, you mean why it's so high? I think it's because when I think it's basically a combination of two factors: light and the lack of grazers. And what happened is when when the winter is over and you have this situation because of the daylight, it's the, the time of is longer during the daylight and also the amplitude is long, it's greater. So you have this period when there's a sharp increase of light availability to the to the San Francisco Bay. And that creates like an imbalance that triggers that really quick response in phytoplankton bloom. And at the same time, the bloom ha doesn't have external constraints such as zooplankton to take it down. So it keeps growing, growing until it keeps the limit, which is light and, and nutrient limitation. Um, I have a 
question about the uh, the resolution on, I sorry, try to plankton model one more time. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about, uh, if maybe I didn't understand it properly, but the, the your uh, bars around your your line when you're modeling the the the, the phytoplankton bloom, um, and you said that there was the range of what the model predicted. What what is that range? It looked to be around 40 micrograms per liter, and and so if you can answer that, and then also the question is what what do you think the resolution or the sensitivity of the model is in terms of being able to predict plus or minus how many um, micrograms per liter of chlorophyll. And uh, so where where do you think you're comfortable with what that model can do at this point in time, knowing that the beginning of development and, and what? Yeah, um, that range actually, I think, mostly represents the impact of height. So, and you see the range gets greater when the role and the daily average condition, uh, chlorophyll A level is greater, um, just because at that time the gradient of chlorophyll is sharper. So you see the effect of tight of flushing back and forth, and that's the range you are seeing. Um, in terms of uncertainty, I think that's something I'm not sure about yet, since most of the comparison we have now is with like monthly data. So to, in order for us to actually quantify to something more like hourly, we need to compare our modeling results with um, high frequency data, which we are we have in house, and uh, unfortunately not for this particular period where I see the model. But it's definitely something we're going to look into next when we run when we apply the same modeling framework for a different water year. Uh, Lester's hand. There wasn't much mention of temperature today. I think if I'm not wrong, the, the bay has been warming. So do any of you want to comment on the role that temperature may play in changing the ecology of the bay as we see you know, global sea temperatures rise and then subsequently inland water temperatures rise? <laughs> Well, you know, um, we, we definitely are seeing um, the decline in DO concentrations in um, the sloughs due to temperature. And um, <coughs> the temperature combined with the um, uh, lack of mixing and limited tidal exchange is the major factor that contributes to, um, to the declines in DO that we are seeing in the marsh. So I think similar. Um, would be seen in South uh, Bay, or the, especially in Lower South Bay, which also suffers from uh, not enough tidal uh, 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 towards the end of summer. And it's shallow. Shallow, yeah. I, I haven't been thinking about it as much for the for the bay proper, but for the delta, have, have been putting some thought towards it, in particular because as you get into higher and higher temperatures, into the 20s, 21, 25, all of a sudden you start shifting the, the the sweet spot it, out of the out of cryptophytes and, and other tasty organisms into into cyanobacteria and microcystis in particular and so I think there there's a real potential for a shift in the community a shift towards chlorophytes and cyanobacteria as well as a shift towards um, toxin producing uh, Tom one one last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I get this to say, so what's illustrated here is what we've known we've known from the get go that it's complicated than production of harmful algal blooms, and further complicated by the fact that they don't happen they happen very rarely. So we don't have the the benefit of studying multiple events to get our insights. So we're going to be challenged to actually to we have to have some confidence in our intuition and and logic applying to how, to how these model the model prediction. But our like so my thought is we also are we also similar modeling the delta where blooms happening more more often. Are we going to be able to can we 
can we use our ability to predict there and study events there in a matter that allow us to inform South Bay similar or the conditions can so different they can't extrapolate. Am I making sense here? Like we I think I understand I think I understand what you mean. Yeah. So with <coughs> so in terms of one of your points about the ability to use models in a in a very challenging setting where you don't even yet know all the factors that cause something to occur. Um, the I think that one of the places people have had some success, or at least they're certainly trying as hard as they can, is along the coast looking at, at, at pr predictive models or probabilistic models for the risk of a harmful algal bloom along the coast. Um, and that's something that what they what what is available there is the observations that, th that those events have happened. Um, and in the Bay, as you pointed out, they have not happened with the, with the level of, of just clearness that we might need in order to know that. Yeah. So I, I think that it's going to be, I think we do need to, as we've talked about a lot, that it, it's a, we're going to need to come up with an approach that allows us to hopefully explore some of these issues and know what we need to keep on the table and what we can dismiss as not important. Um, I think it's going to be through a combination of, of observational data and, and and maybe some targeted modeling studies that help us rule, rule in and rule things out. Okay, we're going to um, wrap this up now and uh, take a quick break of, of about 15 minutes. Um, so um, re please return for the next session on emerging contaminants. And just a quick <laughs> reminder. Quick reminder that um, there is a social event at Jupiter across the street at the end of the meeting. 255. You know where? Hey, Maureen. How you doing? This is good. That was the, that's the best talk I've seen. Not that, not that it, it was already a high bar. That was fun. I'm a retired reporter. Did you hear my eyes roll? But, but yeah, I was actually a part of a talk here briefly, and I thought, hey, let's yeah. Yeah. I thought it'd be cool to connect with you guys again and check in on it would be. level stuff. And that would be great. Can I walk? Can I walk out with yeah. you? So you were part of the